It's Wednesday, the 26th of October. This is Politics Live. Joining me today, Conservative MP Kevin Hollinrake, Labour's Clive Lewis, Anoush Chakalian from The New Statesman and political strategist Joe Tanner. Today... The Prime Minister and I have decided that it is prudent to make that statement on the 17th of November when it will be upgraded to a full autumn statement. What does that tell us about the difficult decisions Rishi Sunak says are on the way? Lots of familiar faces are back in their old cabinet jobs, including the Home Secretary, who resigned just last week over a security breach. How on earth does it meet standards of integrity, professionalism, to a reappoint someone who's just broken the ministerial code? The Prime Minister has taken her apology, and he has decided that what he wants is uh, an experienced uh, Home Secretary. This is a short history of Rishi Sunak and Brexit. The Prime Minister says he'll be embracing the opportunities of Brexit. But what does that mean? And Keir Starmer will face Rishi Sunak at Prime Minister's questions for the first time. So, Rishi Sunak's first full day as Prime Minister, and as expected, it's been a busy one. We've just heard the news that the uh, statement we were expecting on Monday, on Halloween, October the 31st, is now being postponed or delayed until November the 17th. You heard that from the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. It's going to be a full autumn statement. We'll talk about that in just a moment. He's been uh, finishing off appointing his Cabinet and other ministerial positions. Uh, he's had that Cabinet meeting already this morning. Morning, and he's going to be in the Commons at noon uh, addressing MPs and answering questions from the Labour leader, Keir Starmer. Um, I'm just going to read you a couple of the headlines from the papers this morning. The Guardian, the Prime Minister's reshuffle gamble on first day in charge. And The Times uh, says, I'll fix mistakes, referencing his speech in Downing Street yesterday, Val Sunak as he brings in continuity cabinet. Yes, there are quite a few familiar faces from both Boris Johnson's cabinet and Liz Truss's, even though that didn't last uh, very long. As we know, Jeremy Hunt is staying on as Chancellor. Suella Braverman is back as Home Secretary. Uh, Dominic Raab, who was a big cheerleader for Rishi Sunak uh, during the leadership contest, is back in as Justice Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister. Penny Mordaunt, uh, who was uh, Rishi Sunak's rival, uh, to take take over from Liz Truss. We thought she might get, and I think she thought uh, she might get a bigger role, but she stays on as leader of the Commons and other allies. Michael Gove makes a return as levelling up secretary and Mel Stride uh, joins the Cabinet as um, Work and Pensions secretary. I'll take a breath for a moment and let's talk <laughs> to uh, Chris Mason, the BBC's political editor. Take Let a breath. Yes, take a breath. stamina. Just a moment of breath. You're right. I haven't got as much stamina clearly as some of these cabinet ministers are, are going to need to have. Uh, Chris Mason, just tell us, first of all, this uh, announcement from Jeremy Hunt. We knew it hadn't been confirmed yesterday about the Halloween statement, and now that's because it's going to be uh, on the 17th of November. Yeah, that's right. I've said this before, but it's worth saying again, diaries have kind of gone out of fashion in Westminster in the yeah. last few months. Any entry placed upon it is guaranteed to get scrubbed out and moved or scrapped or binned or whatever. The latest case study, uh, yeah, this uh, economic statement that we were counting down to, and a bit in the diary and had a certain amount of stickability uh, for Halloween for Monday the 31st of October next Monday well it's unstuck it's moved it's moving to if I've done my calculations right three weeks tomorrow Thursday the 17th of November oh. it'll be a full autumn statement to use the Westminster v uh, vernacular and there will be the full forecasts published then by the Office for budget responsibility. So why the shift? Well, a couple of things, I think. Firstly, uh, the markets are a bit calmer, so there isn't the urgency that there was to kind of hurtle it out the door as quickly as possible to try and reassure. The additional 
twist, if you like, on that is that because the markets are a bit calmer, uh, we won't see those numbers from the Office for Budget Responsibility for a few more weeks. And therefore, when they do all of the crunching of the numbers, they might not look as gloomy as they would if they were churned out sooner. And then the sort of more obvious practical point, it gives the uh, new Prime Minister and the new-ish Chancellor a bit longer to work out what on earth they're going to say and not least speak to lots of new or returning secretaries of state in various government departments uh, and have potentially some rather awkward questions about their budgets. Yes, talking of awkward questions, um, what about the reappointment of Suella Braverman as Home Secretary, bearing in mind she only mm. departed uh, that role a week ago? Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? This time last week, Suella Braverman was Home Secretary. This time this week, she is Home Secretary, but she spent much of the intervening six days being a former Home Secretary. Why? Because she broke the ministerial code in two places, so said the former Prime Minister, and yet she is back in the door as Home Secretary. Now, there are quite a few Conservative backbenches whose eyebrows headed north on hearing that news yesterday afternoon. Labour too, and Labour will pursue answers to that uh, in the Commons. They'll ask specific questions about the exact chain of events of what Suella Braverman did that cost her her job. And then they'll ask a far broader question, which is, if the new Prime Minister is making a big thing about integrity, mm. uh, why has he taken this decision? The argument coming out of Downing Street is that they believe that Suella Braverman is a talent that they want within the government. They admire her focus, for instance, on trying to find solutions to the whole issue of small boats crossing the channel mm. uh, and indeed tackling crime. So they think it is an argument worth making uh, and questions worth facing in order to have her back around the cabinet table. And what about um, your reaction and response and what do you read into more broadly uh, the reshuffle and uh, some of the people that are in post and presumably hirings and firings might continue throughout today? They will. They'll carry on this afternoon immediately after Prime Minister's uh, questions. Prime Minister will be back in Downing Street to do uh, just that. I think, broadly speaking, it's an attempt to have a cabinet in a broader shade, range of shades of blue than Liz Truss managed. She faced lots of criticism, didn't she, from within the Conservative Party because of that sense that she built a government pretty much entirely in her own image, froze out pretty much anyone who'd backed Rishi Sunak uh, over the summer. I think he's trying to learn that lesson because it, clearly uh, having the party behind you is a necessary but not sufficient thing to have in order to be able to govern successfully. But it is necessary. Case studies, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, if you decide not to do that. But if you start doing that and you, for instance, appoint as he has, a flag bearer for the right in someone like Sir Ola Braverman, then you will face questions as he is doing about that kind of about that kind of decision. But that's clearly what is motivating number 10 in the, uh, in the kind of personnel that they've decided to recruit to the top table. Let's see how it uh, pans out with the lower rungs of government this afternoon. Well, Chris Mason, thank you very much. And I've caught my breath uh, again. Uh, we'll let you go and uh, follow everything else <laughs> that unfolds. Um, to our guests. Um, We've heard there from Rishi Sunak <coughs> saying that he wants a government of integrity, professionalism and accountability. We're going to come on to Suella Braverman in just a moment. But my opening question is, do, does this achieve it? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, the, the most important thing I think people want, the public wants, is stability. And they want a government can, that can take the big issue, tackle the big issues. So to do that, what he's tried to do is form a cabinet of all the talents in our party. So he's got people like James Cleverley, Ben Wallace, who are from Boris Johnson's... Boris Secretary, Boris Johnson's Defence Secretary. ...allies, but also people like Michael Gove levelling up and Grant Shapps in terms of Business Secretary. So he hasn't just gone for one side of the party or one cohort. He's, he's picked people from right across the piece, which I think is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, do you agree, Clive? Is this a cabinet that is going to reassure um, and, uh, in Rishi Sunak's probably mind, uh, prompt a period of stability? Um, I think... I just think it looks tired. Mutton dressed as lamb is what I've my notes down there. I mean, look, I understand he's got to bring in people from all wings of the party, but if you have to bring in Sueda Braverman, who is a kind of incompetent version of Liz Truss, then I'm kind of struggling to find credibility in this government. And I think it shows just how weak his position is that he had to bring someone from the ERG, namely Sueda Braverman, into his government. She isn't up to the standard. Charles Walker said she isn't up to spec. She isn't capable of doing the job. They are his own backbenchers and, and you know, support who are saying this. So clearly, he's already been dealt a bum hand in terms of the people he's had to bring into his government. And so, you know, look, <clears throat> I understand the public wants stability and Rishi Sunak may give temporary stability, but 
that stability doesn't mean that we've ne means that we're not falling apart at the seams, that the, the markets aren't in turmoil, that we don't have the chaos that we've had. That doesn't mean that people's lives are any better in terms of the cost of living, in terms of their energy it bills, does, in terms of food because security. Interest rates on the mortgage well, are lower. <clears throat> well, you've just, you've just committed. The first act of Jeremy Hunt was to commit my constituents to a cliff edge in six months' time so that the average family pays a four and a half thousand pound energy bill. That was your policy, Clive. That was Labour's policy, policy too. This is on the energy, so, so, this is on the energy, on the energy intervention. Bill. It was Labour's so, policy, actually, it was, it was April, Labour. but the cliff edge still exists. Yeah, but obviously yeah. Labour had other policies as well in place which would have ensured that we would have been able to bring better economic stability and better economic growth into right. this into this equation. I'm going to come back to you two in a moment. First of all, just your impressions of the Cabinet and what it says to you. Well, I think bringing in old faces obviously gives you the benefit of having experienced ministers around the table, but it's also a risk because these ministers have a record. People will remember Dominic Raab and his failures during the Kabul evacuation, for example, when he was on holiday. Gavin Williamson as well, he's back, and he made some mistakes over the exam result formula during the pandemic. So it means that Labour has actually got a lot to get its teeth into in terms of a lot of these ministers records so there is a risk there right and what do you think about uh, the cabinet balance on one side with continuity but as anoush says some of them have got a track record that perhaps isn't uh, very appealing to people. Yeah, and I think that is a, a huge challenge for, for the new Prime Minister and, and also for those individuals because there are still cases to be answered, I guess, on some of those things that have passed. But there's also new talent. There's people like Mel Stride, who's been really well regarded, I think, as the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, um, coming in at work and pensions, and people like Gillian Keegan, you know, a former apprentice herself, now as, as education, education secretary. So, you know, you can, you, we're never going to see a team that you think brilliant. We agree with all those posts. I think I've heard from some Conservative MPs that they were concerned about Suella being a mistake and that it's a big distraction. But I also think that potentially if you're bringing someone in from the right, you've done that with a, a sort of cloud over them. So essentially it's like one step out of line and you're out. You've actually got a little bit of control, which perhaps he wouldn't have had with some of those other characters. So I think it's not the way necessarily you want to start as you're, you're going to go on. But let's see if, you know, the, the sort of the rowing together and the fact that the Conservatives recognise they've, they've really, this is the last chance now to get this right. Well, let's talk about Suella Braverman in a little bit more detail. I mean, she was forced to resign, uh, Kevin, as Home Secretary last week after breaking the ministerial code, sending an official document from her personal email that contained private uh, information about migration policy. Is she really the right person to be in charge of national security and back in post? Yes. I mean, she made a mistake. She apologised for that. But I think you should keep things in proportion. She didn't share this information, which was information that had already been shared with MPs in some form or other. Um, she didn't share she's it with the, she didn't she's share broken it with the ministerial post. She she's, shared she's it with the, she didn't share it with the Russian Secret Service. She shared it with oh, a trusted colleague, thank goodness. a member of parliament, a fellow member of parliament, someone who was acting as an informal advisor to her own for her own policy decisions. Are you, are you, are you going to tell me that ministers have never informally shared? potential policy thinking with colleagues, mm. with trusted colleagues within their own There's party. A, the, the, of course, I it mean, happens I, all the time. I'm sure it does, but the difference is now... But the difference is now that there's a, a, a conflict going on with a, a cyber security giant, a cyber security issues around Russia, um, and what she's done is she's taken sensitive information that could have affected the markets as well, sensitive information, which is then sent from her, from her own email account, which is not secure. Which well, she so, said was a mistake. So which, which was a mistake, but it's also a breach of the ministerial code. And there's a reason the ministerial code is there. It's there to protect the interests of government, the interests of this country, and to ensure that ministers do not abuse their position. Now, you can say, well, it's fine, she's apologised, but actually the ministerial code is there for a reason. She broke it. But it's not just the fact that she broke it. This is someone who simply isn't up to the job of being Home Secretary. And that's not just the Labour Party saying that. That's your own party colleagues saying it. Charles Walker and many others have said that. Many so I think, too, you know, well, listen to, the, listen to the BBC correspondent saying that backbenchers have sent their eyebrows north he on her appointment. Name, he didn't mention well, any it, names. He doesn't, because that's what his job isn't to name <laughs> his contacts but and the is people it he speaks it? to. But it's quite clear is, that she is a problem. Is think, it worthwhile the political capital well, that's going to be expended? This is what it boils down to. We've got crisis in terms of immigration. We've got a crisis in terms of small boats across the channel. Mm. Who do people trust to deal with those crises? Yvette Cooper, 
or Suella Beverman. She's, I, I, abs she's, I absolutely think it's more likely to tack that, tackle that issue than the alternative, into, in, certainly the opposition alternative. So let's see what Suella can do. If she resolves that crisis, that, that problem, that's a humanitarian problem solved for this country and for people coming, trying to come into it by illegal means. Is the strategy going to pay off here for Rishi Sunak in that appointment of Suella Braverman? Um, it is the subtext, of course, is that there is a round over uh, immigration. There was with Liz Truss in terms of the former Prime Minister wanting to relax some of the immigration restrictions and Suella Braverman being very much against it. But in terms of keeping the right of the party, the right of the Tory party, inside the fold for the moment, is it worth it? Is it worth the gamble? I think it's going to be a case of the probably the next couple of weeks are going to show whether it is the right gamble. I, I actually, for one of the first times in my life, sat in a Conservative Party conference speech which was Suella's. I ended up there by accident. I, I've never been a party member. I was there as a commercial visitor and I happened to go in um, just to see what the hall was looking like and I sat in on her speech and the audience were trying to give her ovations at several points during the speech even though she hadn't finished and she actually had to tell the audience she hadn't finished but they l were lapping it up. So in terms of the group of the party that potentially may not have voted for Rishi Sunak had the vote gone to the mm. membership, perhaps that's where he's looking to say, look, I've got someone in the cabinet who actually you like and who's talking your language. It is a risk. It may affect the policy direction, but at the same time, this is a government that is going to achieve nothing if you do not have the support of your parliamentary party, and that's what's failed the, the last two, so they've and got to get things right. Well, I think Joe's right. right. She is sort of the darling of the Eurosceptic right of mm. the Tory party. She was chair of the European Research Group of, you know, that's a very influential group of Eurosceptics in the party. And so Rishi Sunak bringing her in suggests that he wants to, you know, pay some lip service to the desires of that group of MPs, but also he relied on her for the nominations that he had to become uh, prime minister. So there was a bit of a deal going on there. And while it might be sensible to bring her into the camp, it's also a big risk because she's a bit of a rogue operator. Remember at that Conservative Party conference, she was accusing Tory MPs of a coup over the 45p tax rate and she was describing Britain's benefit street culture, you know, which was quite tin-eared considering what people are going through in terms of the cost of living crisis. So I think that will be more of a headache for Rishi Sunak than the breach of the ministerial I actually, I actually think they're gambling on her bringing herself down. If, if there is a chance oh, that she is going to... It doesn't seem like but a position it can't of strength, be, though, does it? I think we can agree. But it's a he's, risk. He's, he's made this call not from a position of strength, but from a position of weakness. Well, let's have a look at the issue of policy, because you were raising uh, the idea of policy. You hope that uh, she will continue along the path of tackling the small boat crossings. And as she has said herself, she wants to see a flight of asylum seekers going to Rwanda. There is another policy, um, one that actually affected your constituency, uh, Kevin. So, Suala Braverman, ready to detect more channel migrants um, and the plan for this was to create an asylum centre in your constituency at one point now that was shelved um, would you be in favour of Suella Braverman uh, resurrecting that policy the policy yes the location but no not, why because it was a village of 600 people and oh. there'd be 1,500 young single men in that village. Imagine if, you lived, imagine if you lived in that village. Well, all the Home advi Office advice is quite clear. They should go in major conurbations so they can access public services. Every single agency, be it the police, be it local authorities, be it the refu refugee agencies were against that location. This wasn't NIMBYism. It was a very poor choice. The, the availability of the location came before the suitability of the, loca of the location. Right. I mean, there are plans, Clive, to open two more immigration detention centres, um, costing, you know, a fair bit of money. Uh, would Labour continue this plan, should they, if they came into office? I can't speak for what would happen in two years or three years' time. But, look, there's a, there's a really simple kind of approach to this that I take, which is that, as a country, as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, as a country that has a history of empire, of colonialism, of responsibilities, um, we have a responsibility to play our part in looking after people who are less fortunate, whether it's from war or the climate crisis, and there is an just increasing. In place. And there isn't, and we have said we'll have a points-based system. Whatever, yep. right, but that's what's come out. We will not pursue <laughs> this sadistic policy of oh. deportations to Rwanda, which one of the things I, I found be quite, deportations what, at all. One of the things I found very, very disagreeable about Suella Braverman, the clip of Suella Braverman saying that it would give her mm. deep pleasure to watch a flight go out to Rwanda. I mean, look, I understand. 
If you're going to have the policy, for, pra policy if you're have the po if you're policy. have the policy for pragmatic reasons, then fine. Tell but taking policy. deep joy from watching people who have come to this country, many of them, who have come to this country seeking asylum, which this country is meant to have a proud history of we offering, and taking joy from that is frankly sickening. And she is now our Home Secretary. So look, we can focus on the, on the small number of, hum, of poor human beings mm. struggling to get into this country from across the channel. You can turn them into the bad people. You can, you, but you have, no nat you have no roots into this country. You've stopped all the roots into this country. Therefore, they become illegal immigrants. It's a kind of catch-22 situation. So, and we can, look, I think the Labour Party are going to take a, hum a humane, pragmatic approach to this. And I think that's where the vast majority of people in this country are not the cruel malign influences that you see from so many people. Are you happy to associate yourself with those words? Suella Bravan said that it's my dream. It's my dream to deport um, asylum seekers oh. to Rwanda. Well, that's about making the policy effective. It's not the taking delight in oh. the suffering of any oh. individual. That would be clearly completely wrong. But this is a this is a policy we brought forward. Of course, I have I, at times it feels uncomfortable comfortable for me too. That's not the solution we want. The solution we want is to is to have an agreement with France or other countries where these people are transiting across these uh, these countries, safe countries. But my question to Clive is: It's okay criticising a policy we brought forward, but you've got to suggest an alternative, and you haven't. Time and time again, you just come up well, with warm no, words we, and we, no policy. No, no, no. All right. Well, you said we, you don't want to say what the policy would well, be. Well, but the, three the, years the policy time. two three years on the very specific asylum centres. I couldn't. I couldn't make a prediction here. But having asylum, having asylum refugee reception centres, clearly, that's right. And they should be in appropriate places, and they should be properly funded. And I think those people should be able to work if necessary. Oh, there are lots of things I, that I think that. should happen, but don't happen. I should. Well, that's a note of agreement there between the two of you. Uh, let's talk about the economy because that is, by Rishi Sunak's own admission, partly uh, why he's in the job as Prime Minister to fix the mistakes of his predecessor. Uh, let's have a listen to what Jeremy Hunt uh, had to say. You heard a little bit of him in the headlines, uh, but let's listen to some more. It's also extremely important that that statement is based on the most accurate possible economic forecasts and forecasts of public finances. And for that reason, the Prime Minister and I have decided that it is prudent to make that statement on the 17th of November, when it will be upgraded to a full autumn statement. And I've discussed this uh, last night with the Governor of the Bank of England. He understands the reasons for doing that, and I'll continue to work very closely with him. Right. Well, we'll be talking about this a lot. But first of all, Kevin, uh, we're talking about a £40 billion black hole in the country's finances. Is it going to be spending cuts and tax rises that we can look forward to? Well, let's see. I mean, what they've, I think it's more likely to be £30 billion. That was according to the um, Bank of England yesterday. Well, because, of the, because markets are calmer, because interest rates have come down. And government borrowing has come down a little government's bit. So but in terms of the direction, billion. we know from Jeremy Hunt, eye-watering decisions. Would you be in favour of cuts to spending departments to public services? Well, I'm in favour of efficiencies, yeah. but I'm not oh. in favour of, of reducing frontline services, quite clearly. I think the pressure is off. I don't think we necessarily have to fill that black, 30 billion black hole today. So it need, we need to obviously look at that over time. We need to try and make sure that we do narrow that gap over time. But to, to make uh, rush into promises in terms of spending cuts for departments that many of whom are already struggling mm. to make ends meet, I think would be the wrong thing to do, right? Would you like to see benefits uprated in line with inflation yes. at around 10%? Yes, would, you would. Yeah. We've already got the uh, the triple lock. That will mean pensions uh, going up also in line with inflation. Right. You don't want to see any spending cuts to frontline services, i.e. health or education. Absolutely. But, inflation, that? but inflation is at 10%. Mm. Those spending departments are already yeah. going to have to make exactly. savings, more than just efficiencies. So well, should that's there why be... I say. Well, hang on, but should there be more borrowing then? Uh, are we talking about... Tens of billions of pounds of more borrowing. Just to a certain extent, yes, that will have okay. to be the case. That was planned anyway, of course. Yeah. What, what the uh, Chancellor has done and the Prime Minister, I'm uh, sure, will endorse, is reversing many of the policies that caused the disruption in the marketplace. Mm. It's absolutely the right thing to do. Well, he's done the markets that. Our calm, he's done that to a certain extent. Calm. I, I personally, I'll be interested to see what he says, I don't think there's any rush now okay. to fill that I just, 30 billion. I just, I, just want, yeah. I just want to clarify it. Yes. The, the way that we're discussing this is like it was another government, mm. like another 
whatever mm. political entity that passed those policies that caused the market chaos. It was the Conservative Party and a Conservative government that caused that chaos, self-inflicted. Well, it wasn't my kind of thinking. No, I know, I know it wasn't, but I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a Conservative government. I think one of the things I think we're going to look out for, and I think where Labour will be looking out for, is whether this £70 billion black hole it is an arbitrary well, figure. Well, 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 I think we're well, talking about £40 billion. So, so it's true, none 40, of us knows exactly. Whatever, whatever the... Well, it's, well someone's, someone's arbitrarily picked a three-year debt-to-GDP ratio that we have to pay back. Now, anyway, how now, would you do it? Now, how now, would you do it? now I think what we're going to hear on the 17th is we'll probably expand that extend that to five years, which mm. will make it far easier mm. for the but it would also backload it till after the German election. So tax and, rises and I think would be that, the best thing in your mind? No, tax rises. So, so tax rises, yes, most definitely. But let's oh. be really clear here. Where that tax falls is really important, and it's on the wealthy. And when I say wealthy, yep. I mean not just high income, right. but wealth. And okay. that's one of the things that I think Labour has now cottoned on to and needs to cotton on to, <laughs> which is the fact that there are billions of pounds. I was looking at, was looking at the Tax Justice UK, £14 billion from equalising uh, income tax and capital gains tax, another um, 8 to £9 billion from equalising national insurance. So when you, why do people who earn their income from wealth get tax breaks when those of us who have to work for a living have to pay higher rates of tax. So that well, raises money is, as well. Well, so you're, the second, are... you're the second mm. um, Labour MP to... Rebecca Long-Bailey was here yesterday in that seat saying the same sort of thing. Clive's expanded upon it. Um, before we get to what Labour is suggesting as an alternative uh, way of having bigger tax receipts, um, are we entering austerity in one form or another, whatever Jeremy Hunt is going to be able to say on the 17th? Yes, I think we already actually have, and you made that point, which is that inflation means that yeah. departments have less to spend because it's eaten into their budget. So we are already, you know, in a time of having to make savings. So in a sense, yes, the austerity period is with us. But from what Kevin was saying, it seems that there is a little bit more of a relaxed attitude now, at least among Rishi Sunak supporters within the Conservative Party, about borrowing. And you don't actually have to fill that black hole with massive slashes to departmental budgets, as perhaps was being suggested mm. during the time when Liz Truss was in power, when, you know, it, it was felt that the debt was too high and that the markets just didn't trust that that money would be paid back and there would be any sort of payback on that investment, if you like. I mean, do you see from people watching politics unfold, uh, having seen another Conservative government admit that there were mistakes made, do you think that is going to reassure people enough that we have a new Prime Minister, but a Conservative Prime Minister, who has now the job of trying to undo the damage, certainly, of the last seven weeks, as he sees it? I think a lot of people are just a bit kind of bamboozled by it all. I think mm. out there it's kind of... This is a, a weird transition of power that they don't really understand. The, there was lots of talk about what Liz Truss's government were doing for people, but they didn't really understand what that meant. They couldn't feel it. And, of course, on the one hand, you were saying, we've, we've done this for you, and on the other hand, people were looking at their mortgage repayments and were about to look at renegotiating their mortgages and realising that they were suddenly looking at several hundred pounds a month more. So they've they've sort of done this, you know, we, we gave with one and we took away with the other. And actually those numbers were not necessarily equal. So I think I think the problem is out there is, you know, yes, this movement of the day I think is actually very sensible and I can totally see why. And this issue about whether you decide you're going to borrow over a slightly longer period, people will look at their own mortgages and say, oh, well, if I extended my term, I, I change what that looks like. There are sort of layman's terms some of this stuff can be translated into, but it's also incredibly confusing. Most people out there don't have a clue what the markets are. They don't even understand what the mm. institutions do. Um, and so I think one of the things that's appealing, I think, about Rishi Sunak and potentially Jeremy Hunt a little bit, I think, from the approach he's taken is that People feel he understands how the Treasury works. People feel that he had an understanding of how the economy worked. Perhaps he hadn't made all the right moves and this issue about productivity and growth, etc. perhaps wasn't Rishi's top priority, but it was felt that at least things hadn't gone crazy under him. So maybe him coming back is less of a gamble than, and I know the appeal of a general election, but actually a general election costs the country a lot of money. It also means that everything stops for even longer than it already has with the Brexit mm. debate and COVID. We've lost so much time that actually having some steadying of the ship, etc., perhaps is what people out there think, do you know what, I just want a bit of calm. I want to know what my remortgage is, mm. you know, my payments on my mortgage, if I remortgage, is going to look like, or my energy bills are going to look like, at least for a few months. 
in the run-up to Christmas. I think uh, people want some stability. Well, right. Yeah, actually, when I go around the country, the thing people most remember Rishi Sunak for is that support that he gave during furlough. the pandemic, mm. like the furlough scheme. And I think that's a challenge for him because people see him as a generous chancellor who gets them through a crisis. Now he's outside number 10 talking about difficult decisions. Mm. As I've said, departmental budgets are already being cut. Mm. People can feel the squeeze in public services. Look at the waiting list for the NHS, for example. Everyone knows someone who's on that waiting list or are indeed on it themselves. So that's really tough for him. I, I, I th much of this makes a lot of sense and it, and it would reflect what I hear in my case. People are, are feeling a great deal of pain. You know, I have people writing to me and asking me if I can write to the energy companies on their behalf, mm. things like this. It's, it, it, it make, it's, it's dire, it really is. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is where I think Rishi Sunak um, will may steady the ship, we'll see. Um, but what I think people also now be are beginning to understand is that this economic system as is currently configured, one that was, it was, you know, saw a fifth of this country living in poverty before lockdown, okay? Mm. I think people are beginning to understand it isn't working for them. I think Scotland's got that idea. I think people around the country now understand and that. And what are you suggesting? So I think what people understand is that maybe they want a period of stability because things are so bad, mm. but I think there is an appetite ah. for transformational change. For, when I say, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, a revolution, but I mean that mm. things need to change. I mean, you look at the social attitude survey, the latest study, 70% of people think that the, that the working people in this country aren't getting a fair deal. I think people now understand that something needs to change. And after 12 years of this government, I think they're ready for that. Kevin? I've got a fair idea that Clive is talking about revolution, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I mean, look at Scotland. Clive raises we're Scotland. Democrats. No, well, we're Scotland, enough, we're going Scotland to be... raised uh, taxes to, to raise more money to try and balance their books, which is a pretty difficult job. But they didn't just raise it on the high earners because they knew it wouldn't raise enough money. Mm. They raised it right across the board from everybody with £25,000 and more. So Clive paints his picture, we'll just tax the rich well, and wealth. everything will balance. I was talking about wealth. You're talking about income, Kevin. Happen. You're talking about income. I'm talking wealth, about wealth as well. We try wealth taxes everywhere. Andalusia and Spain just abandoned their wealth tax. It doesn't raise the money. It deters investment. Well, That's what would working? happen. How trickle down working for you? That, uh, well, OK. Trickle down. OK, I'll give you an idea on trickle down. When we took it over in 2010, the top 1% contributed 25% to all taxes of all taxes. Today it's 30%. That's trickled down. It's providing more money from the highest earners. It's the right way to do it. It's a balanced way, not the radical revolutionary way. I tell my you, constituents you, you, waiting you would, for me. But Kevin, waiting you admit list, that's why Liz Truss is bills. no longer here anymore because I, I, that was what she uh, yeah. tried to do more broadly, and it clearly didn't no. have the support. I'm going to bring in Stuart Hosey actually because you've been talking about Scotland. This is a good time uh, to bring him in. Although we're going to talk more broadly. Hello to you. Um, um, SNP MP Stuart Hosey. I'm uh, <laughs> going to talk more broadly about the mandate issue, which I know is what you want to talk about. But perhaps you'd like to respond to what you just heard uh, Kevin Hollenrake say uh, about SNP's economic policy in terms of trying to raise revenue. Uh, well, two things. Uh, firstly, the Scottish Government, as you know, mm. has to run a balanced budget. It's not allowed to carry debt. And so it needs to raise the resources one way or another in order to fulfil all its spending commitments. And in terms of what it's subsequently done, particularly in terms of tax, we did introduce the 19 pence tax rate mm. for the lowest earners, something in the UK sensibly toyed with and then inexplicably abandoned. So it's not true that more people in Scotland pay more tax than in the UK. They either pay the same or less. I think 70% pay no more or less. It's a sensible approach to raise the funds required to fill the spending. All right, Stuart Hosey, as I said, we're going to talk about the issue of mandate because you and other opposition parties have been calling for a general election because there's been yet another change of Prime Minister and Conservative Party leader. Let's just remind ourselves what Rishi Sunak said about mandate yesterday in Downing Street. The mandate my party earned in 2019 is not the sole property of any one individual. It is a mandate that belongs to and unites all of us. What's wrong with that, Stuart Hosey? Well, in principle, he's <coughs> correct. The mm. mandate doesn't belong to an individual. This mm. is a parliamentary democracy. It's yes. not a presidential system. So far, so good. However, we're not talking about the change of a single prime minister during a parliamentary term or a first minister. These things do happen. We're talking about three prime ministers in the space of two months. This simply isn't credible. And when he was anointed a day or so ago, mm. it was only a few Tory MPs even had a say in that. I mean, the, the argument I've been making is 
there were only six Scots got to vote and they were all Tory MPs. There hasn't <laughs> been an affirmation vote in the House of Commons. Right. This, but... is, a, this is a government mm. with a Prime Minister with no mandate and no legitimacy and self-evidently there should be a general election. I mean, it's a problem, isn't it? Well, uh, <laughs> Stuart... Conveniently forgets. I mean, to be fair, three prime ministers in two months isn't ideal. There's no uh, doubt about it. <laughs> that might be <laughs> the greatest understatement. understatement. <laughs> but Stuart, Stuart forgets they had two uh, first ministers in two days, because and the second one elected unopposed, which is Nicola Sturgeon taking over from Alex Salmon. So there's, there is precedent for this, Stuart. So, you know, do say, don't try and say that without a hint of irony, please. Right. I mean, Stuart Hosey, on that, I mean, are you saying it should be a constitutional principle that if you elect a new leader of a party um, or prime minister, you, you should have an election, a general election? No, Joe, I, I said right at the beginning, you know, prime ministers, first ministers mm. do change during parliamentary right. terms. Brown took over from Blair, Major yes. took over yes. from Thatcher. So... But th this is different. But what? How this many are you saying? You're going to put a number on it? No, or, no. I mean, if it's a principle, it's a principle. I think this is rather different. I think you cannot have the shambles of three prime ministers in the space of two months with cabinet after cabinet after cabinet of retreads. Some ministers who've sacked, been sacked or resigned twice in the space of a few sure. months suddenly taking the reins of office again. There comes a time when this isn't credible, not just to the people, but to the markets as well. Uh, I genuinely and firmly believe uh, that this is not a legitimate government. There yep. is no mandate for it. And there really should be a general election. All right, well, Only you said that. Well, let's determine. explore the route to which you might get to a general mm. election because it's not obvious to me. Um, I just want to have a look at this tweet from Ian Blackford. He's the leader of uh, the SNP in Westminster. The Tories have lost the moral authority to lead. You've just heard that from Stuart Hosey. Labour need to find a backbone from somewhere and test the mood for a general election in the Commons. They have the power to bring forward a meaningful vote of no confidence. Get on and do it, Clive. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and look, I think trying to bring a coat no confidence now with the Conservative Party and Rishi Sunak about to give his, his first PMQs. Everything is about timing. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you put in a, a, a no confidence motion, you want to have some prospect of winning it. And I would have made, I would have made the, there would have been a case for this, perhaps in the chaos of Liz Truss, mm -hmm. definitely. But now, with Rishi Sunak in place and the Conservative Party rallying around him, no, come on. You want to you wanna have a realistic prospect of being able to achieve your goal. Otherwise, it, it just looks silly. Can I just put a word in for so. the people as well? The only yeah. people oh, I you're heard, talking for the people. All, <laughs> I, uh, the only, well, the only people I speak to that have heard that are calling for a general election are the opposition or the media. Not The, the people in the street well, do no, not want not, a general election. my inbox. They I'm just not, want I'm not, sure inbox. Inbox. I'm not sure the media want one. I think they want a bit of a rest. I think they want a bit of time That's it. We're going to take a pause. Just to welcome uh, viewers from the BBC News Channel, hello to you. We have just under 10 minutes until Prime Minister's questions. Rishi Sunak's first at the dispatch box as Prime Minister, facing the Labour leader, Keir Starmer. Um, I'll just introduce our guests. We've been discussing uh, the economy and now the mandate uh, for Rishi Sunak. We have Kevin Hollenrake uh, from the Conservative Party, uh, Labour MP Clive Lewis, Anoush Chakalian from the New Statesman, political strategist Joe Tanner and Stuart Hosey uh, is here with us from the SNP. You heard there what Clive uh, Lewis said. Um, also, they have a majority, the Conservatives, Stuart Hosey. If there were to be a vote, you'd lose it. I, I did hear what, uh, what was said there. And, uh, you know, I understand Clive Lewis's position perfectly well. Mm. You know, we don't want anyone rallying around this new Prime Minister. But there does come a time when a point of principle has to kick in and supersede the you know, evident utility of the situation. We have a government which really has no moral authority whatsoever. I think the time has come to bite the bullet, to put the confidence vote to Parliament, to test the will of Parliament uh, and to try our utmost in order to deliver... An right. election for the people, no, you've so made, that they can decide you've made that what the very shape clear. of the government well, will be. Well, let's see if you persuaded Clive. I mean, it would be like running into machine guns in the First World War battle. I mean, it, it's, it, I, look, I understand, and I think that the, the moment has been missed, but it doesn't mean that there won't be another moment mm. in the near future because this government isn't out of the frying. It isn't out of the fire yet. But Clive, uh, it's probably going to go into the frying pan. So uh, I think there will be more opportune moments 
to call for a general election. I think the opportunity has been, I think we missed that opportunity with the chaos of this trust. There is going to be a period of stability with Iran around Rishi Sunak. Let's come back to that. But the point, if I could make very quickly, in terms of mandate, I mean, look, Boris Johnson's mandate was on 44% of the popular vote on the first past the post. There is a bigger issue here yes, I know about right. our democracy mm. and how it works. And it isn't just about the personalities in the Conservative Party and the chaos, it's also structural. Uh, Stuart? Yes, I, I did many interviews yesterday and the same themes were covered. And Labour MP after Labour MP was calling for a general election. The only mechanism which we have is through a vote of no confidence. It doesn't make sense uh, to will the ends without actually supporting the means. Uh, Labour really do need to uh, get a grip on this. Come on, if they want right the election, here. they were demanding <clears throat> yesterday, then they've got to support a, confidence, a no confidence vote today. There's no other mechanism to deliver the election. Stuart Hosey, thank you very much uh, for joining us. As I say, in five minutes' time, we're going to have Prime Minister's questions. Um, more drama uh, and excitement, or maybe not, depending on the strategy that is taken on by Keir Starmer. Let's have a look at this piece in The Guardian. Starmer urges focus Sunak attack lines as Tories expect poll bounds. Um, does this mean there is going to be a change of strategy? Obviously, Keir Starmer has had a busy time dealing with Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss and now Rishi Sunak. Yes, I mean, he's been warning his shadow cabinet, let's not be complacent about Rishi Sunak being the new prime minister. It does pre present a challenge to Keir Starmer. He's someone who has presented himself as a man of integrity, a serious politician, perhaps a little bit boring and a little bit managerial in order to draw a line between himself and Liz Truss and, you know, more significantly, Boris Johnson, which was a big contrast. Now that's harder because this is basically Rishi Sunak's pitch. Um, and so there are certain pitfalls that he doesn't want to fall into, something that they have to be careful about, for example, is sort of going too far about, you know, attacking his wealth, for example. They don't think that's a particularly good idea because there's a sense that the public don't really mind about that. More fruitful, they think, is to go on his record. You know, he is someone who is associated with that Boris Johnson government that actually fell apart towards the end. He was fined during Partygate, for example. So there is the record to go on and it's all about economic arguments for the Labour Party. But it's quite fascinating that over the summer, Lots of people were looking at the Labour ads that were starting, going, oh, the Conservatives were just given all this ammo because mm -hmm. there was this row going on between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. But Rishi Sunak was proved right. Mm -hmm. So you can't really use the fact yeah. that he predicted all this as actually attack ads anymore because this is the guy that predicted it. So he is actually the person who is potentially the best person at the moment to sort it out. Yeah. So it is a really difficult position that Labour have got themselves into because we yeah. all sat there with our head in our hands thinking this is the most incredible content. Mm. And you would see why you'd have wanted a general election straight off the back of that. But now it's kind of scuppered everyone because he was right. Yeah. He was proved right on so many levels. Yeah. Yes, so that leadership campaign has aged well. Um, difficult for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think what we'll see is, I think that poll bounce is possible. Um, I think it, what it does, it puts an onus on Labour to make sure that it has a credible alternative. to Because this government is locked in pretty much. It, he, we've, I think we've established he's in a weak position bringing in Sueda Bravman. So there is limited room for manoeuvre and what he can do. And he has a very febrile party. I think what Labour now needs to do is assume that, that those massive poll leads may reduce. But that means that the public are going to be looking for what are you going to do to change mm. things for the better. Mm. And I think that's what our task is now over the next two years, to paint that picture in bright, vivid colours. We've, we've sketched out the pencil lines. Now it's time to fill that in. And, you know, I think that's what we're going to need if those polls close. And I think that's what's critical for us to do in the next, in the coming weeks, months and What years. does Prime Minister Rishi Sunak need to do today? Well, I hope, and she's right, that, that Labour try and go on his record, go on his record of the furlough scheme, go on his record of bounce-back loans, go on, the, on his record of providing support through the cost of living crisis, go on his record of understanding the economy and putting the right measures in place. So I think that's what, if we're, a Labour focus on that, Bring it on, I would say. I mean, it's interesting that Anoush says um, that Labour broadly, Keir Starmer's office, don't want to attack Rishi Sunak on his wealth um, because he is the richest mm. uh, Prime Minister. I don't know exactly how wealthy he is. Uh, some of your colleagues do want so, to so um, I... have a go at Rishi Sunak about that along the lines of saying, how can he know, have any idea what it feels like uh, in the current economic crisis? I think you can mention it <laughs> and I think you can remind people and I think people know that. Um, you know, Look, we've got a, a you know, multi-billionaire head of state, uh, hereditary head of state, and we've got uh, a billionaire prime minister. And I think when people make the argument that we have an economic system being increasingly run 
uh, for the rich and the wealthy and their material interests mm. and the public feel the real impact of the cost of living crisis, I think it's going to hit home. But I, I still think that whilst you can remind people of that, your key message has to be about painting that vivid picture about how things will be different under Labour, about how we will change this country for the better, for the majority. If we stick on that, remind people about the waiting list in the NHS, about poverty, about food banks. We can because do everyone complained that Boris Johnson didn't have any money and had to borrow money to get the wallpaper changed in number 10. Now you've got a guy who's completely uncorruptible because he's got his own money. Yeah, he can't so it's very difficult in terms of which one you like but it's or don't not, like. But it's not, it's not about calling him corrupt any, other, any more than you're saying that a system that allows someone to become a billionaire in the first place is corrupt. Mm. It's not calling him that corrupt in that sense. But it is saying that his empathy levels may be, may be an issue. But would suggest that he did get what was going well, on. Well, Ferdo had a lot of holes in it. But I understand in the public perception, Ferdo was something that people felt made a massive difference to their lives. And you can't, you can't deny that. But there are lots of other things on that record in terms of the NHS waiting list, in terms of austerity over the past 12 years that you can talk about as well as part of his record. I mean, interesting, YouGov have done some polling which suggests 67% of people think Rishi Sunak is out of touch. How important is that, Kevin? Well, I think they're wrong. I mean, I, 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 he's a family friend of ours. I've seen him in his constituency. I've seen him with, with just normal people uh, every day. And he he's, gets on very well with me. He, he talks to people of all different backgrounds. Um, his constituents, in my experience, think the world of him. So I, I, I don't see that. And again, when you look at what he did through the difficult crisis we had in the past, the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, he didn't direct support to the big banks, the big business, he directed it to households and to small businesses. I don't think that shows him as being out of touch, quite the opposite. Yes, although mm. interesting, as Anoush said, it might also mean they will expect well, more just, mm, funding just, and spending, which may be the right thing. But, just, uh, just on that, he gave a 91% tax break to big oil companies, some of the people who are fueling the energy crisis, a 91% tax break. No, what we did, so, if, uh, if yeah, you actually would, look no, at the facts I, of what I he do did, introduced a windfall tax. No, no. But said you could offset the windfall tax by capital investment in more energy, energy production. Yeah, Perfectly oil sensible. production, that's the key we, we thing. Need oil, yes, we you need do, gas, but and, we not, need and it also includes new oil, Absolute Kevin, nonsense. new oil, which pushes us past 1.5, I think we're, we're going to be going into nonsense. the chamber uh, shortly. I can see Kemi Badenoch, um, I think, at the dispatch box just before uh, the first PMQ, so I'll keep an eye. In fact, I can see the speaker now, Lindsay Hoyle. Um, let's just hold for a moment and see if we are going to start with the first question question to Rishi Sunak. I call Dr Alan Whitehead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mr Speaker. This Can I just say, don't damage the furniture. Cheering by all means, but don't damage, come on. <laughs> Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. I'd like to congratulate the Prime Minister on his uh, new post and indeed uh, as being the uh, first uh, Prime Minister of a South Asian uh, heritage, uh, which I think will be a cause of great pride among many of my constituents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I also have uh, some pride in welcome, welcoming a fellow Saints Southampton supporter <laughs> uh, into number 10. Um, during, his, uh, during his prime ministerial campaigns, the last prime ministerial campaign he ran, he, <laughs> he pledged to prohibit any development of onshore wind, which is now the cheapest form of power available to us in the country. Now he is Prime Minister. Will he change his mind on that point? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, kind words and look forward to seeing him at St Mary's. Although uh, I know my, my friend, the, uh, the Leader of the House, may have something to say about our love of, uh, <laughs> uh, of saints. Look, when it comes to energy policy, I stick by what we said uh, in our manifesto, Mr Speaker. The important thing is, though, to focus on our long-term energy security. That means more renewables, more offshore wind and, indeed, more nuclear. That's what this Government will deliver. <laughs> I'm surprised, Mr Speaker, to be uh, asking a question, and I know you're shocked, Mr Speaker, too, because I know that you, uh, like many people, thought I would have already been offered a ministerial post. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, I didn't hold my breath. Philip Davis. <laughs>
go, go figure, as Joe Biden might say. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. uh, <laughs> can I, can I, can I congratulate? Can I congratulate my right honourable friend on becoming prime minister? Yeah. Yeah. He's absolutely the right person for the job, and I wish him every success in post. And as he knows, he's got my full support. He's, he's two, he's two, he's, he's, his two immediate predecessors made levelling up a key part of their agenda. Would he reaffirm his commitment to levelling up and start as he means to go on by approving the levelling up fund bid for Bingley in my constituency? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, great, I'm grateful to my uh, honourable friend uh, for his, his warm remarks. I can confirm he must be the, the only person, Mr Speaker, who texted me to say that he did not want a job in the last 24 hours. Uh, but I can give him my cast iron commitment to levelling up, particularly in Yorkshire, which he and I share. Uh, obviously, he'll, he'll know I can't comment on individual bids, but by the end of the year, an announcement is expected on the success, and I wish him uh, every luck with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah! Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and may I welcome the Prime Minister. The first British Asian Prime Minister is a significant moment in our national story. And it's a reminder that for all the challenges we face as a country, Britain is a place where people of all races and all beliefs can fulfil their dreams. Yeah. That's not true in every country, and many, didn't, and many didn't think that they would live to see the day when it would be true here. It's part of what makes us all so proud to be British. Yeah. Was his Home Secretary right to resign last week for a breach of security? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Ronald Wood gentleman for, for his kind and indeed generous uh, welcome to the dispatch box. I look forward to Prime Minister's question time with him, and I know that we will have, no doubt, robust exchanges, but I hope that they can also be serious and grown up. So I look forward to it. Well, he, he, he asked about the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised that. She raised the matter, and she accepted her mistake. And that's why, that's why I was delighted to welcome back into a united Cabinet that brings experience stability to the heart of government. And let me tell you, Mr Speaker, what the Home Secretary will be focused on. She'll be focused on cracking down on criminals, on defending our borders, while the party opposite remains soft on crime and in favour of unlimited immigration. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Yesterday, the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and promised integrity, professionalism exactly. and accountability. But then, with his first act, he appointed a Home Secretary who was sacked by his predecessor a week ago for deliberately pinging around sensitive Home Office documents from her personal account. Far from soft on crime, I ran the Crown Prosecution Service for five years. with Home Secretaries to take on terrorists and serious organised crime. And I know firsthand how important it is that we have a Home Secretary whose integrity and professionalism are beyond question. So, have officials raised concerns about his decision to appoint her? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I just addressed the issue with the Home Secretary, but, but, he, uh, but he talked about fighting crime. I would hope, I would hope, Mr. Speaker, I would hope that he would welcome. I would hope, I would hope that, as we look forward, he would welcome the news today that there are over 15,000 new police officers on our street. And the Home Secretary will be supporting them to tackle burglaries. Well, the party opposite, the party opposite will be backing the lunatic protesting fringe that are stopping working people going about their lives. Yes, Starmer. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I listened carefully. That was clearly not a no. We can all see what's happened here. He's so weak. He's done a grubby deal exactly. trading national security because he was scared to lose another leadership election. Yeah. There's a new Tory at the top, but as always with them, 
Party first, yep. country second. Yeah. Yesterday, yeah. yesterday, yeah. on the steps of Downing Street, he also admitted what the whole country knows. The Tories have crashed the economy yep. and now somebody has to pay for their mess. Yeah. I say it shouldn't be working people who've been hammered time and again by this lot, yeah. but those with the broadest shoulders must step up. Yep. Does he agree? No. Well, well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman talked about party first and country second. Perhaps he could explain to us why it was a few years ago he was supporting the member for Islington North. <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, my record is clear. When times are difficult in this country, I will always protect the most vulnerable. That is the values of our compassionate party. We did it in COVID and we will do that again. Mr Speaker, he says he'll protect the most vulnerable. Let's test that. The government currently allows very rich people to live here but register abroad for tax purposes. I don't need to explain to the Prime Minister how non-dom status works. He already knows all about that. <laughs> it costs the Treasury £3.2 billion every year. Why doesn't he put his mouth where his money where his mouth is and get rid of it? Yeah. Well, well, Mr Speaker, I have been honest. We will have to take difficult decisions to restore economic stability and confidence. And my honourable friend, the Chancellor, will set that out in an autumn statement in just a few weeks. But what I can say, as we did during COVID, we will always protect the most vulnerable. We will do this in a fair way. But what I can say, I am glad, Mr Speaker, that the party opposite the honourable gentleman has finally realised that spending does need to be paid for. It is a novel concept for the party opposite. This government is going to restore economic stability and we will do it in a fair and compassionate way. I know he's been away for a few weeks, but he should have listened to what's been going on the last two. But anyway, I, I, I have to say, I'm surprised he's still defending non dom status. He pretends he's on the side of working people, but in private he says something very different. Over the summer, he was secretly recorded at a garden party in Tunbridge Wells, boasting to a group of Tory members that he personally moved money away from deprived areas to wealthy places instead. Rather than apologise or pretend that he meant something else, why doesn't he now do the right thing and undo the changes that he made to those funding formulas? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know. I know. I, I, I know the right. I know the right honourable gentleman rarely leaves North London. But if he does, but if he, if he does, he will know that there are deprived areas in our rural communities. In our and across the South, and this government will relentlessly support them because we are a government that will deliver for people across the United Kingdom. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he mentioned the last few weeks. I am the first to admit that mistakes were made, and that's the reason I am standing here. But that, but that is the difference between him and me. This summer, I was talking, I was being honest about the difficulties that we were facing. But when he ran for leader, when he ran for leader, he promised his party he would borrow billions and billions of pounds. I told the truth for the good of the country. He told his party what it wanted to hear. Leadership is not selling fairy tales. It is confronting challenges, and that is the leadership the British people will get from this government. Mr Speaker, I think everyone should watch the video and make their own minds up. In public, he claims he wants to level up the North, but then he boasts about trying to funnel vital investment away from deprived areas. He says one thing and does another. But they're shouting. They're not my words. They're not my words. 
They are the words of the former chair of the Tory party, sacked yesterday for telling the truth about the Prime Minister. Even his own side know he is not on the side of working people. That is why the only time he ran in a competitive election, he got trounced by the former Prime Minister, who herself got beaten by a lettuce. <laughs> So why doesn't he put it to the test, let working people have their say and call a general election? Well, it will take a long time to get through this paper if we carry on like this, Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, he talks about mandates, about votes, about elections. It is a bit rich coming from the person who tried to overturn the biggest democratic vote in our country's history. Our, our mandate is based on the manifesto that we were elected on to remind him an election that we won and they lost. A mandate that says we want a stronger NHS, better schools, safer streets, control of our borders and levelling up. That is the mandate that I and this government will deliver for the British people. There's not even a of questions. You want more? Come on, Heather. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to congratulate our new, my right honourable friend, our new Prime Minister, and also to thank our previous Prime Minister for the straightforward way she has handled her resignation. And I wish her and her family well for the future. Yeah. Would my right honourable friend please use this, his first appearance of the dispatch box, to make it clear to the British Medical Council and the British Dental Association that as well as training, more, more training spaces opening up, that they must allow new doctors and dentists to work in the UK so that the good people of South Derbyshire can get treatment on the NHS? Well, I thank, uh, I thank my honourable friend for her question. She's absolutely right. I'm pleased that there are 3,500 more doctors and over 9,000 more nurses working this year than last. But she's right, and we are working to simplify the registration for dentists in particular that are not trained here to practice here. And that's how we'll help deliver a long term workforce plan for the NHS and ensure everyone can get the care they need. Let's come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I congratulate the new Prime Minister on becoming the first British Asian to hold the office. The significance and the symbolism of this achievement is to be warmly welcomed by everyone. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yesterday on the steps of Downing Street, the new Prime Minister promised to bring, and I quote, compassion to the challenges that we face today. So, on his first full day in the job, let's put that to the test. A winter of uncertainty is coming, and next April we'll see a cliff-edge moment. Millions face a double whammy as the energy price guarantee is cut off, while households are hit by austerity 2.0 and a real terms cut to social security benefits that many rely on to survive. If people are actually to trust the new Prime Minister's words about compassion, will he today reassure people and guarantee that benefits will rise in line with inflation yeah, yeah. in his upcoming budget? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, again kind, kind remarks. And what I can tell him is my record on this is clear. Through the difficult times that we faced in this country yeah, yeah. through COVID, I always acted in a way to protect the most vulnerable. Yeah. That's because it is the right thing to do, and those are the values of our compassionate party. And I can absolutely reassure him and give him that commitment that we will continue to act like that in the weeks ahead. Yeah, Blackford. Well. Mr Speaker, let's test that, because as Chancellor, the Prime Minister slashed universal credit yep. and presided over the worst <laughs> levels well, you know, for, the, for the hard of hearing on the Tory side, I might remind them that universal credit was cut by £20 a week and presided over the worst levels of poverty in North West Europe. So I hope that he has learned from his mistakes and guarantees that benefits will rise in line with inflation. But speaking of mistakes, yesterday the Prime Minister appointed a Home Secretary who was forced to resign only last week for breaching the ministerial code and who boasted, boasted that she dreamed of sending vulnerable asylum seekers to Rwanda. We all know why he appointed her a sleazy backroom deal to shore up his own position. 
far from being a fresh start. This is a return to the sleaze and scandal and ghosts of Cabinet's past. The Prime Minister promised to govern with integrity and humility. So if he has an ounce of either, will he admit his mistake and sack the Home Secretary without the delay? Mr Speaker, I was pleased to actually have a call last night with the First Minister of Scotland. It was important that I spoke to her on my first day in office because I wanted to express my desire to work constructively with the Scottish Government so that we can work together to deliver for the people of Scotland, and that is what I plan to do. And indeed, I hope crime is one of the things that we can collaborate on because he will know that violent crime is rising in Scotland and police numbers are falling, whereas here we are increasing police numbers, Mr Speaker. But I look forward, I look forward to working with the Scottish Government on our shared challenges because I believe in a strong United Kingdom. Yeah. Dr Andrew Murray, sir. Mr Speaker, what a pleasure it was to welcome the Prime Minister to my constituency in the summer. He will know one of the burning issues in my constituency is the proposed waste incinerator at Westbury. With the government rightly reviewing its air quality targets, can I ask my right honourable friend to signal his intent to continue promoting public health, net zero and the environment by placing a moratorium on any more unwanted, unnecessary, toxic waste burners? Prime Minister, I can tell my honourable friend, I know he's been a vociferous campaign on this issue, as I, uh, as I learned over the summer. He'll know that local authorities determine these issues, but also to reassure him that all large incinerators in England must comply with strict emission limits and only receive permits if plants don't cause any damage to human health, and hopefully that is reassuring for him. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's reckless predecessor took a wrecking ball to nature, prompting millions of members of the RSPB, the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust to rise up in opposition. Yesterday, he promised to fix her mistakes as well as to uphold the party's 2019 manifesto. So if he is a man of his word, will he start by reversing the green light she gave to fracking since it's categorically not been shown to be safe, and instead maintain the moratorium that was pledged in that very, morator- in that very manifesto that he has promised to uphold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've already said I, I stand by the manifesto on that, but I, what I would say is that I'm proud that this government has passed the landmark Environment Act, yeah. putting more for the natural environment than we've ever had, with a clear plan to deliver. And I can give the Honourable Lady my commitment that we will deliver on all those ambitions. We will deliver on what we said at COP, because we care deeply about passing our children an environment in better state than we found it ourselves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too would like to welcome the Prime Minister to his place. Farmers in my constituency of Cluid South are delighted that after 20 years they are once more able to sell Welsh lamb to the US market. Would the Prime Minister comment on the size and prospects of this market for our world-beating Welsh lamb? Uh, well, uh, M- Mr Speaker, I congratulate my, uh, my colleague on the fantastic achievement. I can tell him that market is worth, I think, something like almost £40 million over the first few years. Enormous boost uh, for our lamb farmers. I would just encourage the 300 million US consumers to give Yorkshire Swaledale a lamb a look in <laughs> as, uh, as well. But I know he and I, if we disagree on that, are united on the fact that we will unequivocally back British farming and British farmers. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is certainly a topsy-turvy Tory government. A few days ago, I was going to put my question to the former Prime Minister, but my inbox has been full of emails from constituents of Lewisham East writing to me about their desperate situation, of their wages simply not going far enough. I'm also receiving emails about rents going up, energy prices going up, mortgages going up, and of course the cost of living is already up. This week, my constituents are writing to me demanding a general election, and I absolutely agree with them. So can the Prime Minister tell me and my constituents when there will be a general election? 
Mr. Speaker, we've already addressed that. But I would say, as I said in the summer, as I said in the summer, I said inflation is indeed the enemy. It makes everyone poorer. It erodes savings, and that's why it will be a priority of our government to grip and reduce inflation and provide support to those who need it, as we do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This autumn I'm launching my campaign to extend the Chilterns area of natural beauty across thousands of acres of scenic beauty, chalk streams and valuable habitats that happen to surround the wonderful town of Hitchin in my constituency. Would the Prime Minister join me in celebrating areas protected by AOMB status and indeed support my campaign to potentially extend them in rural Hertfordshire. Yeah, here we are. Well, I thank my uh, honourable friend because I know this is uh, a matter of great importance to him and his constituents. And he's right to highlight the benefit that natural parks and AOMBs can bring to our lives and our well-being. Uh, I understand actually that Natural England is considering an extension of the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty, and I know my honourable friend will be vigorously taking up his campaign with them. Richard Burger. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the Prime Minister to his place. A nurse would have to work over 20,000 years in order to match the vast wealth of this Prime Minister. The Prime Minister knows all. The Prime Minister knows only too well that the super rich could easily afford to pay more in taxes. So rather than announce a new wave of cuts and austerity, wouldn't it be fairer for the Prime Minister to introduce wealth taxes on the very richest in our society? Well, Mr Speaker, we will always support our hard-working nurses, and that's why, as Chancellor, we reintroduced the nurses' bursary and provided more training and introduced, actually, very strong pay increases. But, as I committed to previously, as we approach the difficult decisions that confront us, we will do so in a way that is fair and is compassionate, because those are our values, and that's what we will deliver. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's determination to be straight with people about the challenges we face as a country. Last week, the Care Quality Commission State of Care report on State of Care in England showed our health system in gridlock. And I hear the same from my constituents, struggling to see a GP or waiting for treatment. So can I urge him to make unblocking the NHS a priority for him and his health secretary. So, well, uh, my my honourable friend knows this subject obviously very well from her own experience, and I thank her for the work she did previously in the department. She's absolutely right about the challenge that confronts us. It's why we've put billions of pounds into busting the backlogs and the elective recovery fund and are delivering funding and staffing to do that. But I look forward to working with her to deliver what we said in our manifesto, and that is a far stronger NHS. Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd uh, add my own congratulations to the Prime Minister on his appointment. Uh, we might not agree on everything, but uh, I think we can all agree a more diverse politics can only be to the good. Yeah. Now, we on these benches believe that Scotland's best future is independence in Europe. Mr Speaker, I, I really would urge the members opposite to show a little more respect, because it's not just us. It's not just us. It's not just the SNP, and I will not be shouted down. It's not just the SNP. On the last opinion poll, 72% of the people of Scotland want back into the European Union. So if the Prime Minister is to maintain any credibility in the eyes of the people of Scotland, how long does he think he can deny Scotland's democracy? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his kind words. I mean, he, talked, he talked about respect. I would gently urge him to respect the result of the referendum yeah. we had on this topic. Uh, but whilst Whilst we, whilst, we will, whilst we will disagree on that issue, I can tell him that I do remain committed to working constructively in partnership with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. Mark Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week I visited worried Year 3 and 6 pupils to hear their suggestions to tackle road safety following a number of serious road accidents outside Boothroyd Academy in Dewsbury. They suggested the Council should do more to help, that their parents should walk them to school to reduce traffic and that commuters should slow down. Would my right honourable friend agree with me 
and with them that we all have a part to play in ensuring road safety outside our schools. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, uh, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it's fantastic that he's engaging with his younger constituents at Boothroyd Academy on such an important issue, and I know they will welcome his commitment to supporting them. And I agree with him. There are various things we can do. There's an updated highway code which strengthens pedestrian access. Local authorities can introduce lower speed limits, and we're increasing the number of school streets, which restrict motorised traffic at busy times. And I look forward to hearing progress on this issue from him. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and said that he wanted to restore trust. Uh, yet in the past 24 hours, we've seen that he's prepared to shamelessly swap uh, red boxes for political support. And there are real serious consequences to all this horse trading. So I'd like him to be clear on this point. Did he seek or receive any advice on security concerns about the Right Honourable Member for South Staffordshire before his appointment to the government yesterday, given that he was sacked in 2019 for leaking sensitive information relating to our national security. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, well Mr. Mr Speaker, he's talking, he's talking about events that happened uh, four years ago. And he's talking, well, he's talking, he's talking, he's right that he raised, he's right that he raised the topic of national security, because members, members opposite four years ago were busily supporting the member for Islington North. Yeah who wanted to abolish the nuclear deterrent, who wanted to leave NATO and who wanted to scrap our armed forces. We won't take any lectures on national security, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I sincerely congratulate my right honourable friend and wish him every success. Over three years ago, my constituent Harry Dunn was killed in a tragic road accident, and I'd like to ask my right honourable friend to join me in congratulating Harry Dunn's family for the incredible campaign they've run for over three years, with huge support from all colleagues across the House, on finally achieving justice for Harry. Yeah, yeah thank, Well, I, uh, I pay tribute to my right honourable friend for her role, and indeed the former Foreign Secretary as well, uh, and indeed colleagues from all over the House for the part they've played in bringing about this outcome. Uh, my thoughts are obviously with the family, and I join in her sentiments that this is very welcome. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, West Hertfordshire Hospital Trust in my area is still hoping to receive funds from the new hospitals programme, the same programme that is supposed to deliver the government's so-called 40 new hospitals. There's been a lot of speculation that the new Prime Minister and his Chancellor might seek to cut infrastructure projects. So can the Prime Minister confirm to me that my local hospital trust, as well as all of the other local hospital trusts that are set to benefit from the new hospitals programme, will in fact get that money, yes or no? Well, well, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor will set out our plans in the autumn statement shortly, but this is the government that put in place plans which will remain to significantly increase capital expenditure, and even though difficult decisions do need to be made, I think the country can rest assured that we will continue to invest in our future productivity and indeed invest in our public services like the NHS. Yeah. Wendy Ball. Uh, Mr Speaker, yeah. in my... Yeah. constituency were at risk of 8,000 new homes being dumped in the constituency. Will my right honourable friend use the opportunity of this Prime Minister's question to reaffirm the Government's commitment to, the, to protecting the Green Belt and to adopting a really rigorous brownfield first policy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, can I, uh, can I say thank you to my honourable friend for her question? Uh, and I did, I can give her that assurance. She's absolutely right. We must protect our green belt, and we are adopting a brownfield first strategy. I'm pleased we had a record number of new homes built in the last year, but it's important that we build those homes in the right places. Yeah. Luke Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whilst welcoming the new Prime Minister to his place, we remember that law breaking was the order of the day in Downing Street during the pandemic. We will never forget that this current <coughs> Prime Minister was fined by the police for attending a birthday party hosted by his next door neighbour. As both a witness and a participant to that law breaking, if the Privileges Committee investigation into the former Prime Minister calls him to give evidence, Will he fully cooperate? Yes. Yeah. 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 Minister. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, and I addressed these matters earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 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 Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you will know that I fought hard to bring back Boris. In 97, I campaigned for Kenneth Clark. 
and then for Michael Portillo. <laughs> so I can't always get it right. <laughs> but you know, I do know about the West Midlands. I know that the West Midlands Mayor very much welcomes the reappointment yeah. of the Leveling Up Secretary yeah. and that he looks forward to working with our new Prime Minister. So may I just ask him, what is his vision for levelling up? Well, I, uh, I, thank, I thank my uh, honourable friend for the question. And, and what I can say is our desire is to ensure that people, wherever they live in our fantastic country, have enormous pride in the place they call home and every opportunity to succeed. And you know what? It is the fantastic Mayor Andy Street who is delivering that for his constituents in the West Midlands. That completes questions. And that brings us to the end of Rishi Sunak's first Prime Minister's questions up against the Labour leader Keir Starmer. Uh, let me welcome our guests for this part of Politics Live. Um, we asked number 10 for a minister. Uh, they are obviously still busy appointing quite a lot of those. Uh, so none were available, but I'm delighted to say we are joined by Rishi Sunak's supporter all the way through the various leadership contests. Tory MP Simon Hoare, also a uh, Select Committee Chairman. For Labour, we have the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, and for the BBC, we have the Deputy Political Editor, Vicky Young. Let me start with you, uh, Vicky, because they're generous words from Keir Starmer uh, to open uh, his questions today about it being an important and big moment to have the first British-Asian Prime Minister. That was also echo echoed uh, by Ian Blackford. But after that, the gloves were off. Yes, they were. He went straight into those attack points, didn't he? They've clearly been planning this. And I think over the years of Boris Johnson, actually, I noticed quite a few times that Keir Starmer would attack who Rishi Sunak, who was then the Chancellor, mm. as well. Because, you know, there were some in the Labour Party who had predicted that one day Rishi Sunak might become Prime Minister. But, yeah, as you say, he went for him on things like non-dom status, uh, for example. Uh, he went for him on uh, a video that came out over the summer where uh, it seemed that Rishi Sunak was saying, actually, I'm going to take money from certain areas uh, and push them towards uh, some of the wealthier areas uh, in the South. Uh, and, yeah, he did go for him. Um, I think what was interesting, though, is that, as you would expect... Rishi Sunak had a lot of support on the Tory backbenches. Yes, we haven't heard that for a very long time. Well, with relief, I should think. Yeah, a lot of them with relief. And I spoke to one minister yesterday who said, look, we played our wild card. I think she meant Boris Johnson. We played our joker. I think she meant Liz Truss. And she goes, this is going to be our ace. So that's what they're all hoping for. And, you know, he did a decent job, didn't he, in reply. A lot of the lines, though, the attacks back on Keir Starmer were very familiar to ones used by uh, Boris Johnson, actually, sort of mm. uh, reminding people that <laughs> Keir Starmer backed Jeremy Corbyn, saying that he tried to overturn the Brexit referendum result. So very similar lines of uh, attack. Uh, I think Rishi Sunak was probably a little bit nervous, but um, he had his uh, had a bit of a grilling today uh, as he was being prepared by people like Michael Gove, who's done it for a lot of former uh, Tory leaders. Uh, Simon, well, let's start with the reappointment of Suella Braverman. Um, why did the former Home Secretary, who is now the current Home Secretary, have to resign in the first place? Well, she dealt with that last week. I've got every confidence, knowing Rishi as I do. He is a man of the utmost uh, probity. All of the correct procedures will have been gone through in order to ensure that he has a robust cabinet. And the crucial thing, if I, if I may just make this point, th there was no point colleagues like me and others criticising previous administrations for appointing cabinets which only reflected the view of the Prime Minister and the leader of the time. When you have, as Rishi Sunak has done, appointed a cabinet incorporating all of the broad church views of the Conservative Party, you are going to have a whole variety of people sitting around the cabinet table. Including if, if one I, if, who uh, has uh, broken uh, the ministerial code. Well, this was, as I understand it, mm. one email mm. which was sent to a colleague who is also a Privy Councillor, so it could, have been, it could have been pleaded or could have been mitigated against mm. on uh, Privy Council terms. But let me I make the point again, because it's an important point. Rishi Sunak rightly has made the point of probity being at the heart of the government. Yeah. I have absolutely no doubt at all in my own mind that he would have made any appointment to any position without all of the 
relevant well, ethics people and the that. cabinet secretary Fine. being satisfied. Well, you're very comfortable with that. Um, and I presume you must have, uh, like your other <clears> colleagues, um, had some sort of assurances. Why then could Rishi Sunak not say in response to Keir Starmer as to whether any officials, and he's probably talking about the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, that any officials had raised concerns about the reappointment of Suella Braverman. Why didn't he just say, no, no concerns were brought to me? That would then be in line with the issues of probity, integrity. Well, again, it, it, it's a nonsense question, because Why? if somebody had, the appointments wouldn't have been made by definition. Right. So you are absolutely sure that Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, raised no concerns about what was a breach, a serious breach, if it was done in two places, to use the, the, the technical term, in terms of information being sent by a private email rather the prime, than The government. Prime Minister does things properly, and I have absolutely no doubt at all in my mind, knowing him as I do over these last seven and a half years, that if the Cabinet Secretary were to advise on any appointment being either inappropriate or wrong, oh. the Prime Minister would heed that advice. This is, this is absolutely a non-story. And just picking up on one thing that you asked, Vicky, um, Keir Starmer may very well have taken the gloves off today, but he didn't land a blow. All right, well, that's fair enough. That's your thoughts. Um, Jonathan, <laughs> um, are you satisfied with what Simon Hall has said about the appointment, the reappointment of Suella Braverman? No. I mean, if you watch PMQs as we do, what you're always going to do is, is cut through what was the real things that we learned through that exchange. And it was that answer that Rishi Sunak gave. And I think what is so significant about that is that, look, the last month has been a disgrace, frankly. It's been an embarrassment to this country. So any Prime Minister coming in was in quite a powerful position simply trying to put some right into what has gone wrong. And yet, Rishi Sunak hasn't been able to resist having to put party before country and do a deal with someone like yeah. Suella Brabham, who shouldn't be in the Cabinet on integrity or ability, let's be clear about that, shouldn't be in there, certainly shouldn't. If that, if that resignation letter is correct that she wrote, if that was honest, that would preclude her from being put back in. Yet he's had to put her back in. And, and my genuine view is, and I say this in, with all good faith, so I'm, I don't think the Conservative Party is capable of stable government. I think there's too many factions within there. I think you have to do these kind of deals if you want to lead it. And it's not right for the country. I'm sick of hearing what is the right thing for Conservative unity. I want to hear what's the right thing for the country. Oh. And, and that's, that's frankly why we need a general election. Well, I think all of us as Conservatives, and I, I actually think all of us as politicians, irrespective of party, would always say it's country first, uh, then it's your constituency, and your party comes, comes third. There's no point, uh, Jonathan, with greatest respect, saying, you know, that, uh, th this, is a, this is a deal here or it's a deal there. What the Prime Minister has done is drawn talented and committed people from all strands of Conservative thinking. One of the inherent weaknesses of Boris Johnson's cabinet making, and indeed Liz Truss's cabinet making, was that they chose people in their own image. So this is not a result of deals done, but it's, 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 it's answering what has been a huge call from the Parliamentary Party right. in order to ensure... I was on a wing, I'm, on, I'm on a wing of the party, which for the last, All right. I suppose, two and a half, three years has really had very little vested in, in its success. Let's we now have, because each opinion has sure. a couple of All people right. well, around the table that, said advocating. That, and I want to move and on it's so important to, for stronger it, government. Yeah, and I think Jonathan understands it. What I want to move on to, though, is the policy. Mm. Uh, and the policies, because actually what Rishi Sunak said in response is that she, Suella Braverman, has got the right policies. Um, defending our borders, being tough or tougher on criminals, which was interesting that he then turned to the idea of what she would do as Home Secretary. Yeah, because the real tension which we know about, possibly that's going to be there on policy, is going to be about immigration. So for all this talk of unity, and he said that word several times, mm. there are huge tensions that are going to be coming to the fore uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so we know that Suella Braverman made it very clear over the summer and since that she thinks that the number of people coming to this country uh, should go down. Now, we're talking here about legal uh, immigration and people coming here potentially on work visas, which of course is what, when you want growth, a lot of people uh, around the cabinet table will want. So what are they going to do about that? What happened this morning in interviews and with Rishi Sunak there, they are talking about asylum seekers and illegal immigration, saying mm. she's going to concentrate on that. How are they going to then marry up uh, that whole desire there for potentially allowing more people in 
to work in this country uh, and her saying we've got to get the numbers down. Who do you agree with? Uh, Liz Truss, as the former Prime Minister who did want to, uh, we're told, um, actually lift the lid on immigration restrictions, or Suella Braverman, who would like to keep a firm lid on it? Well, I can't keep track of which positions yeah, each but, cabinet well, minister Well, I've spelt them out for I, you. I don't think... Uh, I was talking to a group of businesses this morning, mm. and what they worry about is exactly what Vicky said. So, Swell Brobin ran a leadership contest even after Liz Truss had, had won the leadership using the Home Office with different policies to the government. Mm -hmm. So they want consistency, first of all. I think immigration should be linked to the needs of the economy. Mm -hmm. I think if we're bringing in people because we're short of those skills... is that skills, why you don't like her? Be is that why you don't like her? Because I, you don't agree with her on the issue, a very a core issue of immigration. Yeah, I, I think frequently she, she's on a whole range of issues. She's uninformed. She... she presents things because they're in her own personal political interest rather than the national interest. I don't like that. I don't like inconsistent government. I want to see the country put first. And would you like to see increases in net migration in order perhaps to grow, uh, sort of grow the country and grow I, I, the economy? I, I, I don't see it as wanting higher or lower. I think you've got, there are certain skills if we need to bring those into the country. There should be links to make sure the skills system puts investment into <clears> that training as well as doing that. So you've got temporary measures. But I don't think the approach where you just try and decouple the UK from the rest of the world is a sensible or realistic position. What do you think, Simon, Suella Braverman will mean in terms of Home Office policy? Well, th let's see how it evolves. Don't forget Robert Jenrick, who will be attending Cabinet, has been appointed as the Minister uh, of Immigration Minister. Now, I think between him and Grant Shapps as the new Bayes mm -hmm. Secretary, there will be, I think Jonathan's right, we have to have an immigration system that meets our economic needs. We're, we're an ageing population, we have a falling birth rate. If we want our public services uh, delivered and the economy to remain vibrant, we can't shut our doors. The crucial thing is, and I think there's probably unanimity between Jonathan and me on this as well, is that the British people need to know that however many people come to this country, and as we've seen today with Rishi Sunak, doesn't our country benefit from immigration in, in all spheres of, uh, of our national life. The crucial comfort that the British people need to have is that those policies are authored in Westminster and voted through by democratically accountable politicians. So for, for those who ever said, you know, the whole Brexit thing was about no immigration at all, uh, they, they or were all lower the, levels of the immigration were secretary who has specifically said the numbers mm. should come down. I think what we don't know in all of this actually is where Rishi Sunak stands on it because I look well, back actually what he said over the summer. He talked purely about illegal yes, uh, immigration. Exactly. And, he and, hasn't talked about what he and, thinks and should happen is, in terms is, of workers. It's on, a, on a human safety store, uh, uh, level, if no other, mm -hmm. we have to be resolute in ensuring that the criminals who are making vast sums of money trafficking over the channel and through other means, some of the most vulnerable people in the world. We have to be absolutely resolute on those. And Suella but, Braverman is but, committed but to, to that and, policy. But to answer Vicky's point, my hunch, and sitting here today it is only a hunch, but as I say, knowing him as I do, Rishi will understand, the Prime Minister will understand, that we have to have an immigration policy which is transparent, which is firm, which is fair, but meets the needs of UK PLC. It would well, be an act, it well, be an act of self-harm if we didn't have that. So you're absolutely right, but the problem with that is you're a lot more sensible than some of your colleagues <laughs> in the Parliamentary Conservative Party. Is, isn't that it? And, and I, therefore, uh, to become every, the leader, every Conservative to colleague become the leader, you, you don't just need to support people like yourself. Rit You've large. got to go and, and, and reach out to people like Swella Braverman and do this deal with them and have them come in. And, and that's, that's the problem, isn't it? And, and that's why I think there's... You know, you can see it already. We're not going to get the stability we need. You know, I've well, already seen the decisions been on. delayed on the on the spending review <clears> because these things won't be resolved, and you can't just put people in with completely opposing well, views. I'm, I'm going to interject out. here because you mentioned transparency, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, Simon, um, and Keir Starmer uh, brought up the issue of a recording that was made of Rishi Sunak during the summer leadership uh, contest against Liz Truss, referring to levelling up. He seemed to be boasting or claiming that he had moved money from deprived urban areas to other parts of the country. Let's take a listen. It was in Tunbridge Wells. I managed to start changing the funding formulas to make sure that areas like this are getting the funding that they deserve. Because we inherited a bunch of formulas from the Labour Party that shoved all the funding into deprived urban areas. Then uh, they, you know, that needed to be undone. I started the work of undoing that. What, you know, Taking money from deprived no, no, urban no, areas. No, no, well, no, he, no. He, he did take money no, from deprived no, areas. He changed the no, formula. He did, is that ah, justifiable? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. This is a fundamental error. First of all, there has to be a clear understanding that deprivation doesn't manifest itself 
only in... Oh, but I didn't but, say no, that. I know you didn't. No, but he's no, saying no, he no, moved no, it. So let's just let's Sorry, start at let first me... basis, because people may not understand what was going on here. He was addressing Rishi Sunak um, during that leadership contest, and that video, that recording, he was addressing Tory party members yes. in Tunbridge Wells over the summer, and he was saying, I managed to change the formula. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but he said, I managed to change the formula from money only going to deprived urban areas, people will want to know what was the justification for taking money well, away from no, no, those areas? No, there's, this, is the, this is the utter and total uh, misconstruction of, of what the Prime Minister was saying. Uh, you can change the formula, but more money was going into those different pots. So it's not a question of robbing Peter to pay Paul. It was in order to ensure... I represent a rural constituency. Mm. If you came, Joe, today to North Dorset and said, take me to your heart of deprivation. I haven't got a heart, but I've got deprivation in each village and town. But because it was sparsely populated, it's really hard to identify. And that's the formula. And the funding formulas were always slewed because it was, frankly, easy for the bean counters to do, to assess it in uh, densely populated areas. Uh, well, Dorset Council, my local authority, was running the risk of having to pay back to government money which it couldn't afford well, let's let through Jonathan, negative well, arbitrage. Labour have made so, like you, add, you add Labour, money to the pot, yeah, but, but you change the rules by which it's divided. So, Jonathan, the video, you listen to that. Isn't that plausible? No, it video, did. No, no, absolutely. The video speaks for itself. It is not about whether this was about urban and rural. Under the formulas that Rishi Sunak came up with, places like Salford and Barnsley, I think, were, were deemed to be less in need than places like Richmond that he represented. It is shameful. It is a shameful thing that he has done. And this is why, you know, forever... I appreciate anyone might look a bit better than Liz Truss after the last month, but there is a lot for us to get into with Rishi Sunak and his record. It wasn't like things were doing well in this country but before he was then put out and Liz Truss sure, came Sure, I take that so point. This but, is particularly but on this particular issue, bearing in mind Keir Starmer brought it up yeah. and made something of it, what is wrong right. with money going into poorer rural areas. There's nothing wrong with a rural urban uh, distribution of funding, but it is completely wrong to say that is what Rishi Sunak was presenting there. He was talking about taking money yeah. from places that needed it, giving it to places that didn't, uh, and wanting support and credibility yeah. for but that. And I, I've he, got to say, on the point that more money went that. in he overall... No, Simon, let me just said the formula. The idea that more money went in overall, a, a local authority like mine in Tameside, in East Manchester, mm. which um, is, is, a, is a less affluent area, yeah, has had its budget destroyed by the last 12 years of Conservative government, where money has been taken out and given to other parts of the country, and the burden of taxation, the council tax burden for local services has gone up enormously. It is not fair, it is not right, and it's not the way that anyone should be, first well, of all, campaigning for support. I, 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 was, I was cabinet member for finance on a rural district council under the last Labour government, and we saw the formulas changed, which took money from the rural areas given to the urban. Uh, what uh, we have to do is put more money in, so it's not a question of urban right, versus rural. It's a question of growing, growing the economy still. to make sure that well, we have the services growing, you've across, you've across the whole of the country. I agree, but that's the key thing. Well, we will. Well, hang on, you've mentioned growing the economy. Let's zoom out a little bit in terms of the economy. We now know that there's going to be a full economic statement, as Jeremy Hunt says, on November the 17th. And Rishi Sunak has said that he's been brought in partly to fix the problems that were set up by his predecessor. Um, is he going to be able to do that, or has the reputation of the Conservative Party been, as commentators have been saying, trashed? Well, certainly lots of Tory MPs fear that that reputation uh, has been trashed. But I guess, if you look at what they've done today, this delay, if Kwasi Kwarteng or Liz Truss had tried to do that, there would have been a massive problem because they had they, they lost their credibility. I think the fact they've managed to do this, and as far as I can see, the reaction in the markets, whatever, has been pretty calm, shows that Jeremy Hunt has managed to calm things down. Yes, the cost has, of borrowing has come down yeah, on sort of he long-term... Also, he's laid out quite a lot of what he's going to do mm. uh, anyway. And I think the big advantage this gives them um, is that if you look at things like the government borrowing rates, they have already come down a little bit. And that ultimately does shrink the black hole, if you want to call it that, that they were going to have to try and fill. So the longer they wait, they're hoping that they won't have to bring in maybe as many cuts as they would have to do. Uh, but it's still going to be incredibly difficult. And just hearing there about put money into the pot, well, mm. there isn't going to be any more money to put into the pot. There's going to be huge decisions to be made, actually not just for the Conservatives, but Labour will have to face this too, about where you where you do that. Do you put up taxes? Where do you put up taxes? What do you cut? I mean, Rishi Sunak hasn't been in government over the last seven weeks. Um, 
But what have those last seven weeks done to the Conservatives' reputation for economic sound management? Oh, it's deeply damaged it, let's be absolutely frank right. uh, about that. For good, uh, really, no, in, in, no, the near, in, no, in the near term, till no, the next election. Uh, no, I, I think there is such fluidity in the minds of the electorate. Um, I mean, certainly talking to, you know, uh, looking at my inbox, talking to voters, etc. I think uh, clearly there was a lot of support for the Labour Party. I think that's quite soft. I, I don't think uh, there's no way Keir Starmer. I'm, I like Keir Starmer. I think he's a he's a good, sensible politician. Delighted but, to hear but, that. but he's uh, I'm sure he'll sleep a lot easier in his bed knowing that fact. But he's no Tony Blair. Let's be absolutely frank. So this wasn't a strong it pro. Need to be. But there wasn't a strong pro, pro Labour vote. So I think. Rishi's competence on this issue, his well, experience and his knowledge, how he dealt with COVID shows that he's not doctrinal on these matters. Look at furlough. That was a practical, pragmatic response to a very pressing problem which we didn't know how long or how deep or how hard it was but going to be. But do you think the markets are now running the country? That's no, why Jeremy no, no. Hunt was brought in. That's why he reversed so much well, of the quasi quarter no, no Liz Truss mini-budget is because the markets have a laser-like focus on the UK and just because Rishi Sunak has come in, that isn't going to change. Well, I... Th I, I, it certainly started to turn around with Jeremy Hunt's appointment. His, uh, the retention of Jeremy, I think, has been very helpful. There is significant benefit, I'd suggest, in delaying from the 31st mm. to the 17th. Sure. Because I don't quite know the dates, but I think it will allow the Bank of England Monetary oh, Policy Committee on the 3rd of to have another yeah. meeting. And, interest rates. and that will give a better indication of the direction sure. of travel. Mor a couple of mortgage rates have already started to drop over these last few days. I think the Coventry Building and Society they, and one well, other. So, more so, let, than so let us hope that this is a trend. Uh, I mean, the, the point is, though, John, Jonathan, um, is that Rishi Sunak cannot be held responsible for what Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng did. In fact, he was unbelievably clear, um, the Prime Minister, during the summer leadership contest, that he disagreed with pretty well every single part of their economic prospectus and the mini-budget. Whereas you, Labour, agreed with quite no, a lot no, of it. No, no, come on. No, come no. On. Look, you, you, first you really, of all, you really did. this is the big Good. story. This is the big story. It's not about PMQs or appointments. This is the story, which is what the last four or five weeks have done to this country's yeah. national finances, yeah. to household finances, to business investment and to public services as a result of that. Now, we opposed the philosophy and the approach of borrowing money to pay for unfunded tax cuts, yeah. which has caused... Which Rishi Sunak said would be immoral. Well... But let's be clear, the Conservative Party are responsible for this. And I don't think you can simply say, oh, hang on a minute, every time we change Prime Ministers, which is on a month-to-month -month basis at the minute, or certainly it is with Chancellors, are we not responsible for anything that went before? The fact is, the Conservative Party is responsible for everyone in this country being worse off and public services being under severe pressure, and it's fair to hold them to account for that. Right, well, let's listen to what Rishi Sunak actually said, precisely in his own words, uh, in the leadership contest to the BBC over the summer. I don't think you can have your cake and eat it. I, I don't think life's that simple. And I think her plan risks making the situation worse when you're borrowing that much money for tax cuts at a time when inflation is already going up. I think people will scratch their head and say, hang on, you, you're telling me we can borrow lots of money, we can have all these nice tax cuts, we don't have to worry about inflation. Somehow, even though those tax cuts don't help poor people or, or pensioners, that will all take care of itself. And that all, I, to me, it just, you know, that, that doesn't stack up. He couldn't have been clearer. Yeah, but he got thrashed. I mean, this is the thing, when Rishi's actually he ran for election, he got thrashed well, by... Well, he got decisively he, defeated He lost, by, anyway. Yeah. By Liz he didn't win. Never mind, and, we're not going to argue about and, how and, the, the difference... And, and he didn't win. <laughs> I think it's fair to say Liz Truss decisively won. But the, we won the argument. Election, oh. well, I've heard, I've heard that from <laughs> a few You've heard that before. As you say, this is the most important thing to say. The thing is, Jonathan, there'll be a lot of people who will say, you did agree with some of the policies of Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss. You certainly supported the two-year energy intervention package. We know that there's going to be a review of that, but you supported that, which was a big chunk mm -hmm. in terms of money being spent of that package. You also supported uh, the reversal of the national insurance contribution rise, and you also supported the cut in the basic rate of income tax. Now, that may have been correct, let me, let but in just, fact, it looks as if Rishi Sunak's been proven right, no, no, and you No, haven't. absolutely not. So, look, first of all, there was the need for an intervention on the energy crisis. Sure. That was trailed well before the budget and caused no problems whatsoever. We had never supported the national insurance rise and was simply being consistent by holding that. They wanted to try and portray us as being in favour of higher taxes. We, we didn't allow that because, quite frankly, the reason taxes are high on working people is because of the last 12 years of growth, which Rishi Sunak plays quite a substantial role in there. But we opposed the philosophy of borrowing money to pay for unfunded tax cuts for the well-off in order to, therefore, grow the economy. We opposed the rise, the we opposed right. the cut in corporation tax, dividends taxation, stamp duty. I could run through it all. So in no way will I accept that we supported that budget. We were there from the 
beginning saying this is a disaster and we were proved right on it. Do you admit now, Simon, um, as actually Rishi Sunak <clears throat> has himself, um, that the economy wasn't exactly in a great situation uh, before Liz Truss came in as uh, Prime Minister? He'd been Chancellor under Boris Johnson and it's now a whole lot worse. We're already seeing that that has fed into mortgage rates. You say a couple have come down, but it has fed into mortgage <laughs> rates. We're probably going to see another rise in interest rates, maybe not as big as it might have been uh, if Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng has stayed. That is the record of successive Conservative governments, and this is just the latest iteration. I don't agree with that. I mean, we have had these two... I mean, the, the phrase existential threat has been used quite a lot this week, but there, 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 there have been two significant impacts on UK PLC. Sure. Well, one was the overall cost of... COVID, which we all know, and every penny piece that was spent, we were right to support business and individuals. And second was the entirely unforeseeable uh, impact that Ukraine right. uh, has had. Now, the question we then have to ask ourselves, I think, as a, as a freedom-loving, democracy and defence-supporting country, is do we take... Do we absorb that hit and deal with it, or do we leave Ukraine go right. hang? We're we have to stand with Ukraine. We're going to have to end it there. Thank you to all of my guests today. On the day that Rishi Sunak had his first outing as Prime Minister at the Dispatch Box opposite Keir Starmer, we will be back with more analysis tomorrow at 12.15.